This new quantum clock has been described as a completely new way of measuring time. In a paper published last month, researchers argued that they had created a timekeeping device, a quantum stopwatch to be precise, made of lasers and helium atoms that can measure the time that has passed with complete accuracy. The paper describes the stopwatch as useful for investigating quantum defects and performing artifact-free timekeeping, and it is thought that the mechanism will significantly improve accuracy in measurements of things like a single molecule falling apart, quantum interactions between light and matter, or material being exposed to a magnetic field. And don't worry, if this introduction has given you more questions than answers, you're not alone. In this video, I'm going to talk about these claims, how this quantum clock differs from the rest, why clocks are such a big deal in physics, and why the best ones aren't really used for telling the time. Welcome to Brain Noises. I am Chloe, science communicator and recovering physicist. And on this channel, I talk about the thoughts that pass through my mind, generally relating to science, but I cannot make any promises. So if that sounds like something you might like to hear more about, then please subscribe. Um, and yeah, thank you for being here. Before I begin, thank you to everyone who watched and commented on my previous video. Um, it was really interesting hearing your perspective on things and as always I get so many kind of video ideas and just like ideas in general from uh, what you think and what you say. So thank you for that. Anyway, into the video. To give you a bit of context, let's start with a crash course in clocks. The first part of this video discusses a new type of quantum clock and a quantum clock is just a type of atomic clock. You can think of atomic clock you can think of atomic clock as a bit of an umbrella term. And atomic clocks have a pretty different mechanism from the clocks we know and love. Regular clocks, regular conventional clocks. Okay, I've already said clocks like 10 times. Put very simply, a conventional clock measures the bouncing of things, so a pendulum, whereas an atomic clock measures the resonant frequency of atoms. Although it sounds fancy, and it definitely is in many ways, you can kind of just think of it as a scaled down version of a grandfather pendulum clock. The natural oscillations of atoms act like a tiny pendulum. However, atomic clocks are far more precise than conventional clocks because atomic oscillations have a much higher frequency and are much more stable. A quantum clock is a type of atomic clock with laser-cooled single ions confined together in an electromagnetic iron trap. Quantum clocks first came onto the scene in 2008, with physicists at the National Institute of Standards and Technology describing a quantum logic clock based on individual ions of beryllium and aluminium, and we've been refining the model ever since. Fun fact, the accuracy of experimental quantum clocks has actually been recently superseded by experimental optical lattice clocks, but optical clocks are still mostly just sort of research projects, and there are a whole other terrifying kettle of fish that maybe we'll explore in another video. To give you an idea of the kind of orders of magnitudes of the clock accuracy rankings, a conventional clock loses about a second a year, a standard atomic clock loses one second approximately every 100 million years, while one of the latest optical lattice clocks will lose one second every 300 billion years. When it comes to this new quantum clock, the clue is in the semantics. It is generally being referred to by journalists and the researchers themselves as a quantum stopwatch. Now, though I don't think calling it a quantum clock would be the most inaccurate way to describe it, the reason this language is important lies in the unique mechanism it uses. Because this quantum stopwatch can tell the time without counting it. Though you might imagine it to be terrifyingly complex, this stopwatch-like method of observing quantum experiments is actually a pretty simple, in relative terms, way to measure the passage of time. Marta Berholtz and her colleagues based the clock on a type of experiment called a pump probe experiment. In these types of experiments, a pump laser pulse is sent into a cloud of atoms, raising them to higher energy levels, and then a second, less powerful probe pulse is used to measure the effect of the pump. 
So one laser is for exciting atoms and one is for measuring what has happened to the atoms as a result of the excitement. These experiments are incredibly important and have an array of uses in biology, material science and even art. In material science we have used this method to study and characterise nanomaterials and in the development of things like solar panels. In biology, pump probe imaging is widely used to help distinguish benign lesions and melanoma with high sensitivity. And finally, in art, this technique helps distinguish between pigments as well as gather molecular information, so we can identify differences between pigments even if they have the same visual colour. You can imagine how useful this would be to people like art historians. So this technique has a lot of uses, mostly to do with imaging, but until recently using it to measure time hadn't really been explored as much. And this is because it can be really difficult to work out how much time has passed between the pump and the probe. This new quantum stopwatch made with helium atoms claims to solve that problem. It is a completely new way of measuring time, says Ronnie Nutt, a member of Berholt's team. With other clocks, you try to improve timekeeping by making it more and more complex, but in our case, we actually go the complete opposite direction. We use basically the simplest possible structure that could tell time. The researchers first fired a laser into a cloud of helium atoms. This would be the pump part of the process. This put the atoms into a superposition of energy states, meaning that they were in multiple energy levels at once. And these energy levels interact with each other. And like in Young's famous double slit experiment, this creates an interference pattern that changes over time. The researchers then measured that interference pattern over a time period as small as 1.7 trillionths of a second and compared it to a simulation of the interference pattern. By identifying the unique slice of time, that specific 1.7 trillionth of a second, where the patterns match, they could tell precisely how long the helium atoms had been in the superposition. The interference pattern never repeats, so they were able to prove without a doubt how long had passed. The paper also suggested adaptations to the system depending on what exactly you wanted to measure. So if one needs to use lower photon energy pump pulses, then other gases could be used instead of helium. The clear benefit of this mechanism is that unlike other quantum clocks, there is no need to measure exactly when the atoms were put into a superposition. You don't have to start the clock, you just look at the interference structure, compare it with the reference and say, right, okay, it must have been this number of nanoseconds. So you can think of it like the start being just kind of built into the mechanism. But it is because of this that this stopwatch won't actually be useful in kind of generally measuring time. It will only really be useful in pump probe-esque experiments or yeah, just experiments where all that needs to be measured is a delay between two times. But although that general timekeeping aspect is ruled out, the pump probe experiment type is actually incredibly common and captures a range of uses. And within those uses, the scientists say that it could be extraordinarily accurate. And so why are extremely accurate clocks useful? The answer might not be as obvious as it seems. I mentioned earlier in the video that the most cutting edge clocks we have lose one second every 300 billion years. For some perspective, the universe itself is 13.7 billion years old. This might ring alarm bells, why do we want or need clocks any more accurate than that? It seems excessive to want a clock when we've already got one that loses one second over the course of over 20 times the lifespan of the universe. Clock accuracy can be affected by a very long list of interactions with the environment. So for example, magnetic fields and electric fields can change the ticking rate of a clock, but the exact Exact effect depends on the details of the clock. So even if you had created a model for it, it would only really apply to that clock. So as you've probably gathered, clocks being sensitive to all this stuff can be a bit of a pain. But if we understand these effects well enough, we can actually harness them in a way that makes it productive. For example, GPS satellites move fast enough for Einstein's theory of special relativity to have a noticeable effect on their clocks, slowing them by about seven microseconds each day. But because they're at a high altitude, the lower gravity experienced by GPS satellites also cause the clocks to speed up by about 45 microseconds every day. Again, as predicted by Einstein, but this time, his theory of general relativity. And so compared to clocks on Earth, the clocks aboard GPS satellites speed up by 45 minus 7 equals 38 microseconds every day. So what does this all tell us? Gravity and speed affects clocks, but it affects them in a way that we can predict 
thanks to Einstein. So since these clocks are good enough for us to consider the effects of external factors such as a change in gravity, we can use them to measure these effects. A common analogy comes from archery. Okay, it's that time, it's that time in the video where I lose feeling in my feet. Professional archers can tell which way the wind is blowing by looking at where their arrows land. They are confident in their ability to the point where they know where the arrow should be landing. So if it lands to the left, say, they can then deduce from which way the wind must be blowing. So for example, a network of incredibly stable clocks should be able to detect gravitational waves at frequencies inaccessible to laser interferometers, which are the highly sensitive instruments that we currently use to detect ripples in space-time. These incredibly stable and accurate clocks are even being used to test if fundamental constants are actually constant, and are providing new options to explore the relationship between dark matter and dark energy and all of the mysteries that surround them. So it really does seem like the world is our oyster when it comes to what these clocks can do or what we expect them to be able to do in the future. I think what's particularly cool is the fact we're kind of harnessing something about them that would otherwise be considered a drawback. And it shows some things really are about perspective. A clock that is very easily disrupted by gravitational waves goes from being a bad clock to a good gravitational wave detector. It's just, it's just pretty cool. Also, if you want something a little bit visual to like solidify some of the stuff I've spoken about in this video, there's a three minute animation that I've linked in my description that kind of covers it very broadly the history of atomic clocks. Anyway, as per usual, thank you for watching and let me know what you think in the comments. I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.